Hi, I'm Emily from Calvert Library Fairview Branch. Thank you for tuning in to Calvert Library Asian Authors Matter. In this video, Calvert librarians will recommend some excellent books geared towards elementary through high school students. Let's jump right in. Enjoy. Hi everyone, I'm Katie. I'm a children's librarian at the Prince Frederick Branch. And today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about this book. It's called I'm Okay by Patty Kim. It's best for ages 10 to 12, 10 to 13 in that range. It's the touching story about 12 year old OK Lee and his many struggles. So we learn at the beginning of the book that his father has just passed away from a tragic accident at work and it's left to him and his mother struggling financially. So OK comes up with a plan to make money by selling his services of hair braiding and tutoring at school. And along the way, he makes some unlikely friends. So it's a challenging story. It's heart wrenching at times, but there are lovely themes about honesty and friendship and self acceptance. So my favorite aspect of this book is Patty Kim's wonderful character development of OK and his friends. It keeps you re rooting for them and cheering them on and wondering about them after the story is over. So definitely pick up I'm OK by local author Patty Kim. That's great. Hi, I'm Sandy and I am at the Twin Beaches branch. And I today would like to recommend um, a teen graphic biography, if you can take all of that in at once, that is called They Called Us Enemy. Um, it is by George Takei, Justin Isinger, and Stephen Scott with art by Harmony Becker. And they take, uh, They Call Us Enemy takes us back to the American government's response to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, the US was at war with Japan, but suddenly all Japanese Americans were considered to be the enemy, regardless of their citizenship status. On February 19th, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066, which established military zones in California, Washington, and Oregon, um, states with large Japanese American populations. Then Roosevelt's order forcibly removed Americans of Japanese ancestry from their homes. Um, Executive Order 9066 affected the lives of about 120,000 people, the majority of whom were American citizens, and one of them was a little five-year-old boy named George. So if you, you know the name, you probably do know the name. If, you, if you're a Trekkie, you certainly know the name George Takei. Um, he actually played Sulu on the original Star Trek series. Um, if you're not familiar with that, you may still know, know his name from um, his other work in Hollywood. He's worked in on the stage and on the screen for years. You may know him from his social media presence. He actually has quite a following on social media. Um, but, or you also may know him as a passionate activist, both for the Asian American community and the LGBTQ communities. Um, but you may not know his story. Um, so his story begins living in California when his father, who was a Japanese national, um, who had come to the US as a teenager, and then his mother, who was born in California to Japanese American parents, um, and his younger brother and his baby sister, until the morning that his father abruptly woke everyone up and told them to get dressed and pack, that they were going on vacation. That's what you tell a five-year-old. Um, but instead, George and his family were moved thousands of miles away from their home in California to an internment camp in the swamps of Arkansas, surrounded by barbed wire fencing, constantly being watched by armed guards. Um, George's father um, actually became quite a leader in the camp. He helped to welcome new families. He helped to make sure that everyone had the supplies that they needed. Um, and George and his siblings made the best of their surroundings, although they were painfully aware of the limitations of their existence. Um, they Called Us Enemy is a firsthand account of George's time in the camp um, and the heartbreakingly difficult choices that his parents had to make to keep them together and to keep them safe. Um, Takei helps bring one of the darkest and really yet I think least discussed um, eras of America's history into light. And Harmony Becker's black and white illustrations, um, inspired by images from documentary photographs of the time and also by Takei's own just razor sharp memory, are, are stunning and beautiful. So I really encourage you to check out um, They Called Us Enemy. Um, it, it's a teen book, but really all adults should read this book. If, you, if you're not familiar with this era, please, please pick this up. Um, available at the library, a new extended version just came out this year as well. Also available digitally on uh, Hoopla through the library as well. So check out They Called Us Enemy. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sandy. Hi, everyone. My name is Tanya. I am a librarian at the Prince Frederick branch of Coward Library. And today I'd like to talk to you about one of my favorite horror animes, Tomei. And it's by Jinju Ito. Um, he is absolutely the best if you want anime horror in the world, I think. Um, this story, um, Tomei, this is one of his books, is about a young girl who uh, is the most beautiful girl that you would ever see. Everyone loves her. Men love her. Women want to be her. Unfortunately, they love her so much that sometimes they just want to kill her. Um, so they do. And <laughs> surprise, surprise, she comes right back the next day and leaves people wondering, did we just kill her? Why is she here? So it's really wonderful. Um, Mr. Ito has very, very many books. Um, that are just great also. Um, one, Flesh Colored Horror is one. Um, if you want something a little bit funny, but still kind of weird, uh, Cat Diary, which it's about him and his family and their cat. Um, he has Slug Girl. Yeah, Slug Girl. Um, and he has The Human Chair. You will never want to sit again in a chair after you read The Human Chair. So this is a picture of Tomei being her beautiful self. So when you try to photograph Tomei, she comes up really, really different than you would expect. So here is Tomei after being photographed. Um, not very beautiful, right? But he still thinks she's gorgeous, this guy here. So my daughter was so inspired by, uh, by Tomei that she wanted to do a Halloween costume. And this is her rendition of Tomei. So beautiful to look at, but don't look at the picture to the side because that's her real self. So if you really want something really great and kind of funny, but kind of scary and spooky a little bit, check out um, Mr. Ito's books, Tomei, and several others. And they're all um, available on Hoopla, Overdrive, and some are available in the library. Bye. Wow, Tanya, that book sounds really interesting. And your daughter's makeup is incredible. Um, I'm Michaela, and I'm a librarian at the Prince Frederick branch of Calvert Library. And I picked up a book called Good Talk. It's by Mira Jacob. And it is a graphic memoir. Um, I love reading books about people and how different people live and what their experiences have been. And I have truly never been too into graphic novels, but I picked this one up just because the cover was really interesting. And sometimes I do judge a book by a cover. And um, I'm so glad I did because it tells a story um, a life experience that I feel like we don't often get to see in books and movies and even TV shows. Um, Mira Jacob is a first generation American of Indian descent. Her parents came to the USA um, and she ends up growing up in New York City and she marries a Jewish man and they have a child together. And so their family is just a mixture of different races and religions and life experiences. And then as their child grows up, he starts asking questions. And so the memoir really goes through her telling her story through answering her child's questions. Um, it's funny. I mean, like literally really LOL funny. Um, there were times that I cried. Um, it talks a lot about what binds us as Americans, but also what divides us. Um, the pictures are really interesting, a mixture of photography and um, drawing, black, mostly black and white, but there's also color pictures. So it was really visually stunning to look at. And it just really, really drew me in in a way that kind of caught me off guard. Now, there are some challenging topics in the book and there's some foul language. So I would say this book is probably best for teens, maybe older tweens and people that feel comfortable um, handling those kinds of topics and that kind of language. And if you enjoy this book, Mira Jacobs also wrote a book called The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, which is, again, it immerses you in a culture you may not have a lot of experience with, or it may make you feel home, like you're hearing your story told, but it's funny and touching and absolutely worth the read. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. And actually, everyone who's covered a book so far and, and will, it's, it's so fun to, uh, to learn about new books that I can read. I'm Shauna from Prince Frederick. I'm a public services librarian. And today I'm going to cover a book by Tracy Chi, which is inspired by her Japanese American ancestry. And the book is We Are Not Free. 
and it follows 14 teens, the sons and daughters of Japanese immigrants, or Nisei, as we come to learn. As Sandy mentioned in her book, They Called Us Enemy, um, in 1942, over 100,000 people of Japanese ancestry were deported and incarcerated in, in camps here in America, um, the, the land of the free. But these, uh, the teens, the 14 teens in this book, are no longer free. And it follows their varied stories through a world that seemed determined to hate them. And um, they reacted with confusion and defiance, pride, anger, and hope. All, all reacted with gaman, another word that we come to learn, a Japanese word, which means enduring the impossible with patience and dignity. Um, what caught my interest, what caught my, my eye about this book was the time period that it covers and that it uses teenagers' stories to, to uh, teach us what, what happened here in the, in the United States during this time. And um, I have a friend, Jeff, who's, whose family also suffered in these camps. And, and his story um, has... has um, I don't know, intrigued me, horrified me, made my heart break. And as I read this book, I, I came to feel as though I had 14 other friends who also had, um, had experiences um, through these camps. So I hope that uh, you'll pick it up, learn about the history of, of, of this country and, and the gaman that, that we can all endure with patience and dignity. Thanks. Thank you, Shauna. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Reiner, and I work with Mobile Services. The book I'd like to share with you today is called Patron Saints of Nothing by Randy e. Rebuy. Um, so this story is about Jay. Um, he is a typical Filipino-American teen who lives in Michigan. Uh, he finds out that his cousin June, who lives in the Philippines, was killed as a part of an ongoing war on drugs that was imposed, uh, imposed by the government. Tragically, this war allows anyone who allegedly uses or sells drugs to be murdered by the police with no questions asked. So Jay's online research convinces him that these methods for ridding the country of drugs are rash and unjust. And Jay remembers his cousin as a good person and can't imagine his cousin being involved in anything so illegal. He convinces his parents to let him visit the Philippines, uh, his Filipino family there, secretly planning to investigate a murder. Mm. So June, of course, they let him go, and Jay stays with June's family, and he's immediately, he immediately distrusts his uncle Maning, um, June's father, who is a high-ranking police officer, and searches his uncle's office for information about June's death. He suspects his uncle may have been involved with June's murder. Um, well, Maning finds out and kicks him out of the house, so Jay stays with other relatives who are more sympathetic to his desire to vindicate June. Um, he hangs out a lot with Grace, who is June's sister, and they both go on this uh, um, investigation to discover like what exactly happened to June. So they track his activities before his death, and they uncover a few unsettling surprises, but still refuse to believe that June was involved with anything so dangerous. So the story continues as Jay and Grace delve deeper into the truth behind June's murder. Um, so I'll not say any more, as I don't want to give the whole story away. Uh, so this book, um, the story hits close to home as uh, many names, places are and references are very familiar to me. Uh, the theme is a very controversial topic in the Philippines today. And reading this, I could actually feel the author struggling to keep um, the politics out of the narrative, um, trying to keep it as unbiased as possible. Mm, Randy Rebuy does an amazing job portraying the importance of religion and the value of family relationships in the Philippine culture. I feel that his use of Filipino terms, how he describes his characters and the environment projects a strong connection to his Filipino roots. Uh, because of the use of profanity, um, the descriptive violence and the talk of illegal substances, I would recommend this book for older teens. Uh, so this book won both the Kirkus Best Young Adult Books um, and the Publishers Weekly Best Book in 2019. Uh, so this book is available at the library, so please check it out when you get the chance. Uh, thank you. 
Thanks, Reiner. That sounds really fantastic. Um, hi, my name is Meg. I'm with Prince Frederick and Cal uh, Calvert Library, Prince Frederick, and I am going to be talking to you today about Frankly in Love. Uh, Frankly in Love is a young adult novel written by David Yoon. Um, it's a story about a uh, Korean American young man who uh, his parents are immigrants. Uh, he's first generation American um, and his family is uh, surrounding themselves with other Korean families in the town that they live in. So he grows up um, in and amongst a lot of uh, other Korean families and kids. He has an extended family that in includes a lot of other children of Korean immigrants who live in his area. And so he has this life experience where he feel it's almost as if um, a Korean uh, community is transported to America and he lives inside of this mini Korean community in America and he has that life um, and then he walks out his door and goes to school and has friends in his very um, uh, non-Korean, a very American um, school and, and has a life with friends that are not Korean and he's split. His, his whole life is split. He has a life of, in this Korean um, experience at home and he has his life in his American school um, at, outside of his home. And uh, really when he goes back and forth um, between the two, he's doing uh, the code switching, which we've, which we've heard about before, where he's um, relating to his parents and his parents' friends and families one way. And when he's at school, he's relating to them in a completely different way. And those two things really uh, have a tough time in every teenager struggle as they grow older and they, um, they get to the point where they're figuring out who am I, who am I? For Frank, his struggle is very different because he's really trying to reconcile these two sides of his life and make them make sense to him in a way that honors his family on the one side. And also he wants to um, be true to himself on the other side. So, and, and, and is it going to work out? He's got a, a girlfriend who he's seeing at school who he keeps separate from his parents. And he's got another interest in his um, life with his parents that may be something that he didn't expect. So um, the story of Frank in Frank Lee uh, and his journey to find out who he really is has just been, um, it was a wonderful read and uh, really relatable and it doesn't pull any punches with uh, strong feelings and, and relationships between friends and family and how you put those two things together and really decide who you are as a person. Um, I would say that the age range for Frank Lee would be um, teenager and up. Um, and it's a wonderful way to um, understand the, the troubles of um, children of immigrants and, and what their lives are, are, what kind of struggles they might have to, uh, to deal with. So highly recommend Frank Lee in Love and um, definitely available through the library. So thank you very much. Thanks, Meg. Uh, my name is Molly and I'm a substitute librarian. So you might see me at any of the four branches in Calvert County. And the book that I have today is a middle grade novel and it's called Tall Story. It's written by Candy Gourlay, who is a Filipina author who lives in the United Kingdom. And she describes Tall Story, which is her first book for middle schoolers as a story about magic, culture clash, and basketball. It follows two estranged siblings, Andy and Bernardo, and the chapters are told from alternating viewpoints. Andy, who lives in London, is a short but feisty 13-year-old girl who loves playing basketball, and her half-brother, Nardo, who's coming from the Philippines to live with her in England, is a shocking eight-foot-tall 16-year-old with size 22 feet. Uh, Andy and Nardo quickly find themselves at odds with one another, from their different heights to their different cultural backgrounds, their desires, their personalities, but their relationship begins to develop and blossom as they settle into their new family normal. 
Um, I found that both characters had really distinct voices and are easy to empathize with, but I especially found myself drawn to Nardo's chapters because I really love the Filipino folk tales and legends that are woven into his narrative. Uh, it really had like a magical realism kind of feel. Uh, I listened to the audiobook version of Tall Story on our library's free Libby app, and I would really recommend it as a family listen along. It has two narrators, uh, one for each sibling, and they do a really fantastic job of bringing these characters to life. Thanks. Thanks, Molly. That sounds amazing. Um, I am biased because I love stories set in the UK, but it sounds fantastic. Um, bring it back home. I have a story that takes place in California where Mia Tang, the protagonist of Front Desk by Kelly Yang, um, lives with her family in a motel where they work. Unfortunately, they do not own the motel where they work. The owner, Mr. Yang, is a notorious racist and angry man who hates her parents and hates all immigrants because he feels like he did things the hard way and everyone else is just trying to take the easy way out of life and nobody wants to work anymore and all kinds of things. He especially hates their long stay customer who is black and he thinks that he is a criminal and Mia just hates this man for being so angry and she really wants to help her parents by buying the motel from him. Now, how is a 10 year old gonna buy a motel? Well, Mia spends her days at school working really hard, getting good at English grammar since it is her second language. And she decides she's gonna enter an essay contest that her teacher has told everyone about because the grand prize is a $50,000 grand prize. And she is convinced, you know what? I don't even know what $5 is. $50,000 sounds like a million dollars to her. And she's gonna buy this motel for her parents. But that's not the only thing that Mia has to deal with. On top of dealing with bullies at school, trying to get better at grammar, she also has the normal kid problems of fighting with your friends, being misunderstood, wanting nice new things and not being able to afford them. And um, this semi-autobiographical work is of course based on Kelly Yang's real experiences as a first-generation American. Her parents immigrated from China, as did Mia Tang's. And a lot of it feels so down to earth and realistic. And several of the experiences are based on things that she went through in her real life. So you can really feel <laughs> Mia's struggles and you relate with her and you just want everything to work out okay. Um, the reading, reading level I'd say is between fourth to seventh grade but I'd skew it a little bit higher because of some of this, the subject matter here for maybe for our middle schoolers more than our elementary schoolers. Um, for example, Mia's mother is the victim of a failed robbery attempt and they do have to rush her to the ER and they have a traumatic experience when they realize the family doesn't have health care and the doctors are going to refuse to give her mother care because of this. Um, we deal with the issue that her parents are hiding illegal immigrants in the motel because they have nowhere else to go. And the police do get involved. So there are some heavier issues here. So definitely for our late elementary or middle school readers that recommend that. And I am not the only person that will recommend this book because it won the 2021 Rebecca Caudill Young Readers Book Award, which are for books that are considered um, high, high interest for like low interest readers. So it'll really grab the attention of, of reluctant readers pretty much. And I wanted to add, not only do we have the physical book for this one, but you also can get the ebook and through Libby. <laughs> so you have no excuse, everyone read it one way or another. Um, it's also fantastic for adults if you want something easier to read. So all ages definitely recommend uh, probably five and up. Thanks, Britt. I'm Maya. Um, I also work in mobile services, and I also have a book set in California. Um, I have a young adult novel. Oh, no, it's all blurry. There it is. <laughs> it's called Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. I found this book um, in June. Um, I was looking through some book lists. Um, I wanted to find a new queer author to read for Pride Month, um, and Melinda Lowe came up on the list, and this is her new book that came out this year. 
um, it um, is set in the 1950s San Francisco, um, and it follows 15-year-old Lily Hugh um, as she, you know, traverses the, the waters of high school um, and balances being a good American girl while also struggling to uphold her family's um, Chinese heritage, but not finding that fine line between honoring her Chinese heritage and also being a good American. So um, it's set in the 50s, which is right after um, China became or was taken over by the Communist Party. Um, so there was a lot of anti-communist and anti-Chinese sentiment in America at the time, especially for Chinese American families. Um, and Lily's parents were both Chinese immigrants. Um, they came over when they were in college. And now, you know, they've lived in the States in San Francisco for many years. They got their degrees here. Her father's a doctor. So they're very um, established. They're very, like, you know, um, important parts of the community. However, they are still, you know, Chinese immigrants. And so they are viewed by um, authority figures as, you know, potential threats to Americanism because if you're Chinese, you're clearly communist, or so was the sentiment, the widespread sentiment at the time. So there's a lot of pressure on um, that generation's kids, the first generation Americans, to really kind of prove to the world that their family isn't a true American family, um, but also to uphold, you know, their family's traditions, their Chinese heritage, their, um, their culture, and also to discover themselves. And that's where it gets extra tricky for Lily, um, because um, as Lily goes through high school, she's becoming, she's realizing that she is a lesbian. And that is very taboo at the time in general. Um, queer and homosexual activity was heavily policed in the, in the, in the 1950s. Um, and also, especially coming from Chinatown, which is a very close-knit um, traditional community um, that was also um, very unheard of, or if it was heard of, it was very looked down upon. So Lily's realizing this about herself and feeling so passionate about it. Um, and there's so many times in the book, I was so proud of her because people were trying to put her down, but she was like, no, this is who I am. I have to stand up for it. And I was like, yeah, you go, girl. <laughs> you tell your truth. She does a really hard things. Like she comes out to her family. She realizes like they might not support her in that, but she does find her people, um, the, the family and the community that will accept her. Um, so there's another girl at school that she um, starts dating, you know, very secretly. Um, and Kath, her girlfriend, introduces her to the Telegraph Club. Um, hence the title of the book, which is a lesbian bar um, downtown San Francisco. So she was able to, you know, go there with Kath um, and meet other um, lesbians, other queer people, and just like really explore like that there's more to life and there's more to sexuality and like, you know, her home life might be very traditional and kind of smothering her, you know, her community, but there is a bigger world out there and she can find the people who will support her and um, help her become the person that she knows she is. Her personal storyline is it's, it's really heartbreaking, but it's also very uplifting. And she's such a strong character um, that's really encouraging for anyone who might be struggling with their self-image or their sexuality or their like their home culture versus their, you know, their country culture clash. Um, so it's really encouraging to watch her navigate that and I'll but, but, like, keep herself at the forefront the whole time. Um, it's also a historical gem. I'm an adult and I learned a lot about American history from this young adult novel. Um, so Melinda Lowe is an incredible writer because she does her research like no other. And I was just this morning, I was looking at her website and she has a whole blog on her website, which is melindalow.com. And there's a blog on there, one of many blogs, um, but this one specifically is called Notes from the Telegraph Club. And it's a series of blog posts of her research that went into writing this book. So some of the posts um, are a brief history of male impersonation, um, finding queer Asian America um, in the margins of history, um, the true story of the raid on Tommy's place, so Tommy's Place was the bar that inspired the Telegraph Club. Um, and then she has um, his, the history of Chinatown and the Miss Chinatown pageant that she talks about a lot. Um, she talks, uh, there's a post about racism and the Chinese American experience 
And then there's also um, a guide to Lily San Francisco. So it's old maps of 1950 San Francisco within pointing out the po places in the book that were either real or inspired by certain sections of San Francisco. So the history and there's like um, her blog posts, there's photographs um, talking about her experience doing the research and pulling it into the book. So it's really fascinating to read about the history and her writing process. Long story short, last night the Telegraph Club it's a beautiful queer love story. Um, it's a historical gem. I learned a lot. It's also like a heartbreaking glimpse at America um, in, the in the very shiny 1950s where everything was perfect, but there is, you know, that deep, dark underbelly of really hardcore racism and really hardcore like suspicion and homophobia um, and all the, all the people who were getting like brushed under the carpet because they weren't American enough. Um, so made me really happy that I live now when I do, but also like made me realize we haven't really come that far and we still have a long way to go. So great read, highly recommend this book and this author. Thanks. Wow, Maya, your book sounds awesome. Um, I also work in mobile services and my book also takes place in California, but modern day. And um, the book I chose is When Dimple Met Rishi by Sandhya Menon. Um, this picture is on the back is an image of when they first met. So yeah, I thought that was kind of clever to put that on the back. Um, it's a YA rom-com. Uh, fun fact, this is soon to be a Netflix India TV show. So that's kind of interesting. Um, I would recommend this book for high school and up. Um, it does come in audio and ebook on Libby. And also there are many copies, um, uh, available at the library, physical copies. <clears throat> it's won plenty of awards. Um, the Amelia Bloomer List, Young Adult Fiction for 2018, School Library Journal, Best Books for 2017, and y'all said Best Fiction for Young Adults in 2018. <clears throat> it's definitely a fun, light read. Um, the characters are Indian American. Um, Dimple, she's a feminist. She's career driven. She is harsh and can be rude at times. Um, she's headed for Stanford, so she's definitely got a lot of internal struggle going on, kind of with what the world wants her to be and who she is. So Rishi, on the other hand, he's very traditional, he's kind, he's very stable, he's responsible. He's headed to MIT um, um, on a career path that he is doing because maybe his parents want him to. Um, he is a comic book um, artist secretly. That's where his passion is, but he really feels like he needs to do what his parents want him to do. Um, there's a little storyline about that in the book, um, and uh, it's really interesting to see how these two characters come together. So they have kind of an interesting relationship. So they're both headed to this summer camp for web app developers, it's their last little camp before they go off to college. Dimple's going because uh, she wants to be a web app developer. That's what she wants to do. And there's, a, there's a, a, a celebrity in web app that she really wants to get connected with. And she's super serious about this. Well, her parents had a different goal in mind for sending her or um, their idea of what her future should be. So Rishi and Dimple's parents got together and they decided that they should be arranged in marriage. Hence, when Dimple, uh, Rishi comes up to Dimple and says, hello, I'm looking forward to our future together. That's what happens, coffee to the face. <laughs> so anyway, that was kind of humorous, um, I thought. Uh, so there's a lot of humor in this book. He had a different thing in mind. He was finding the love of his life. Um, I thought the book itself was a great introduction to Indian customs and cultures. Um, definitely it's an own voices novel. Um, and there's also a Bollywood competition in here, which when I was reading it, I thought, if you're just this camp to develop web apps, what do you have time for Bollywood competitions? But anyway, it was kind of a fun interlude. And I did find out that Sanjay Menon is like a huge Bollywood fan. So she found a way to write it into her book. Audio and narration was fantastic. Um, I enjoyed uh, the voices and also the pronunciations. There were a lot of, uh, there's a lot of vocabulary that they introduce you to um, with the Indian custom and culture and dress and food that I might not have known how to pronounce. So it was nice to, I had both this book and the audio that I listened to. It was nice to bounce between. Thank you.
Well, I hope you're as excited as I am to pick up these books, read them yourself, and share them with a friend. Visit calvertlibrary.info to find these titles and to explore all that Calvert Library has to offer. Thank you.